Hello everyone. What we're going to do here in this chapter 7 is we're going to talk about financial assets. Basically a financial asset is cash but also those other assets that are easily and directly convertible into cash. So what we're going to talk about here is not only cash but we're going to talk about investments that we can make also called marketable securities as well as receivables. Remember, receivables are those amounts due from our customers. We provided a good or a service to that customer, and they haven't paid us in cash yet, but we do have this asset called receivables. And ultimately, we're expecting to turn around that receivable and collect cash uh, really soon. All right, this is kind of the money flow. You can see when we provide a good or a service to a customer, we're going to enter into an account receivable. Ultimately, we will collect that cash, collect on that receivable, so that is a cash, um, and then we're going to use that cash to either pay our bills, or if we have any excess cash laying around, we, will, we might want to invest some of it to earn some interest or dividends. Now, obviously, there's investment um, philosophies. You can invest very conservatively. You can invest very aggressively, but in any event, when excess cash is temporarily invested that is considered an asset called marketable securities so that is the money flow um, cash obviously the current value of cash is its face amount um, investments are recorded at their current market values and you know the market value of certain investments go up and down all day long every day so I'm going to show you the accounting journal entries for adjusting for market values. An accounts receivable is reported at their net realizable value. We will work through that process of deciding which receivables, you know, what their net receivable values are. Basically, it means what management estimates to be collectible. Just because we have a receivable does not mean we'll necessarily collect it in full. And we might need to actually write down the value of the receivables. If certain um, certain things come to light, like as an example, your customer went bankrupt um, and we're simply not going to receive all of the receivable or possibly we might receive none of it. So in summary, cash is reported at the face amount on the balance sheet. Marketable securities, your investments are reported at fair market value and your receivables are reported at net realizable value on the balance sheet. And we're going to go through all of those examples. Cash basically represents cash, money orders, checks, traveler's checks, bank card sales. Um, basically, anything on deposit is defined as cash. A cash equivalent in cash is usually reported on the same line item in the balance sheet. A cash equivalent is considered something that is very safe. It's got a very stable market value and it usually matures within 90 days of the date of acquisition. It could be a T-bill, it could be a money market fund, it could even be a very quick short CD, um, certificate of deposit. Um, sometimes an organization can have cash that is restricted. Basically it means that um, some organization, maybe the bank that loaned us money, they are requiring us to set aside cash for a specific reason, um, specifically earmarking it for the repayment of their liability, as an example. If that's the case, then we're going to separate our operating cash and our restricted cash on the balance sheet. So just be aware of all this. A line of credit basically means that the bank has agreed to advance us money in the future should we need it, up to a limit, of course. If we, draw, if we do not draw upon that line of credit, there's no liability. But as we draw upon that line of credit, obviously the money we take from that line of credit, we're going to have a liability that needs to be recorded as well. Okay, cash management is huge in business. And what we need to be aware of is cash can easily be stolen. We can easily be defrauded with cash. So what we want to do is a company needs to uh, prepare internal controls over cash so we can try to prevent fraud. 
We can be efficient with our cash management. We can be accurate in our accounting. Uh, we can be more accurate in our anticipating borrowing needs. Um, and, and make sure that we have adequate cash reserves on hand, but not excessive. If there's any excess cash, we can go ahead and we can invest. All right, so this is the reason why we want to develop internal controls. All right, one of the big internal controls is separating the different functions, handling cash, and maintaining accounting records should be done by two individual separate employees. All right, this is called segregation of duties. If you ever heard a term like that, that's what this means. Um, we want to prepare cash budgets for the future. What does our what is our you know future cash receipts and payments look like? Our cash balances. So we have an idea of what it looks like. We certainly want to do things like that. This is stuff that we would put in our internal control. Um, we want to make daily deposits. Doesn't make sense to have cash lying around the office. Get it in the bank is ASAP. Um, we want to pay by check or credit card. Um, we don't want to actually pay with physical cash as much as we can avoid. Um, we want to make sure that before cash is spent, before we write a check, that a, an appropriate supervisor is agreeing or verifying the expenditure, um, separate obviously from the person signing the checks. And one of the most important things we want to do in the accounting department is we want to prepare monthly reconciliations where we reconcile the bank statements. All right, now reconciling, uh, uh, before we get to the bank statement, let me show you this. Sometimes if we are a retailer, um, we have a cash register and sometimes the cash register at the end of a shift. Some of you may have some cashiering experience in your background. I know I do. It was one of the first jobs I ever had a long time ago. And I remember at the end of every shift, I had, an account, I had to count my cash drawer with my supervisor. And if I was a little over or a little short, we would need to record an adjusting journal entry. And here's the example. Let's say the total cash sales on the cash register tape was $4,500. But when, when I count the register drawer, there's only $4,485 in there. We're $15 short. You would have to record this journal entry as you see down here. We would debit the cash over and short and credit cash. Now, for some strange reason, if the cash drawer had $15 more than it was supposed to have inside of it, this journal entry would be reversed where you would increase cash with a debit and you would record a credit to the cash over and short. The cash over and short typically is recorded as a miscellaneous expense. Okay. All right, now let's go to a bank reconciliation. A bank reconciliation is when we try to reconcile the, check ba the, the bank balance on the bank statement and the general ledger balance for cash. There are going to be differences because sometimes there are transactions that we know about that we've already recorded in our general ledger for cash, but the bank doesn't know about it yet. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, deposits in transit. Deposit in transit is when we record a deposit, usually on the last day of the month, all right, and then we bring that deposit to the bank, and maybe the bank does not actually um, officially record it until the first of the following month. Well, as of the last day of the month, that is cash that we're showing in the cash ledger, but the bank's not showing it. That's a deposit in transit. <coughs> Next, outstanding check. This is the opposite. This is when we write a check, and we've reduced it from our cash ledger balance, but the bank doesn't know about it yet because the person we wrote the check to has not presented it for payment. Okay? Therefore, that is a difference between the, the cash ledger, which the cash was reduced, but the bank statement was not. That is called an outstanding check. And also, there's going to be situations where the bank knows about certain transactions that we don't know about yet. Um, that could be um, like the bank could have collected a receivable for us. 
Um, that's something that we would want to take into consideration um, on the reconciliation where it was recorded on the bank side, but not on our ledger yet. Maybe the bank recorded uh, bank uh, service fees and they took money out of our account. Uh, we don't know about it yet until we got the statement. So these are various examples where the bank may necessarily you know, ha know about something that we don't. Okay, here's an example. Let's work through this. This is what a bank statement looks like, and I'm sure everyone has their own bank statements, and they pretty much get the idea. So here's the bank statement for July 31, 2018. So the beginning balance was the previous statement balance in this example, $5,029.30. Add up all the deposits for the month, $7,186.91 and subtract out all the checks written as well as the other decreases. And we can see that here, um, totaling 7,216. And so the ending balance is $5,000.17. I want you to take a look at a few things. Like on the deposits, do you see this CM? CM stands for credit memo. INT stands for interest. So the bank gave us credit for $500. Maybe they collected a note a receivable for us. INT, they gave us interest. This is very generous today's day and age, right? Where interest, it, everyone's getting interest on their, their checking accounts. We don't see that too much nowadays. Now about on the debit side, we have these checks clearing, but we have a few things here. DM stands for debit memo, $5. I'm not so sure what that is. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know. Maybe some sort of bill was paid for five bucks and our account was debited. NSF. Some of you may have heard that term before. NSF stands for non-sufficient funds. So here's a check for $50.25 that we thought our customer paid us, but we found out that it was a bad check. Non-sufficient funds. And so what the bank does is they take it back out of our account. And then SC stands for service charge. Bank took $12 from our bank account as a service fee. All right, so with all of this information, as well as some other items, we're gonna be able to do a bank reconciliation. All right, we know what a service charge is. We know what an NSF check is, um, credits, miscellaneous charges. Okay, so what are the steps in preparing the actual bank statement? I'm sorry, bank reconciliation. What you're going to do is this. The bank reconciliation has two sides to it. First, we're going to compare the deposits in the bank statement with the accounting general ledger for the cash account. Any deposits not yet in the bank statement but went through the cash ledger, they are deposit in transit. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to compare the checks. The, the checks paid that went through the bank statement compare it to the general ledger, the cash ledger. Any checks that we actually issued and we took it out of our bank, ba bank balance on our cash ledger, but the bank doesn't know about it yet, that is a reconciling item. All right, any debit or credit memos the bank issued that we don't know about, that's a reconciling item. Um, any other adjustments like service charges, NSF checks and the like, those are reconciling items. All right, and then the last step is as follows. Any adjustments on the ledger side of the reconciliation, we are going to record as an adjusting journal entry. Okay, this is what we know. Here's the example. July 31, there was a bank statement. We saw the ending bank balance. We saw this from a few slides ago. It's $5,000.17. The cash ledger was $4,262.83. Now I'm going to go back and forth between the actual reconciliation and the information given. There are two sides to the reconciliation. We're going to start with the balance for the bank, in this case $5,017. And Here's a double underscore, so that ends, that concludes the first half of the reconciliation. And the bottom half, balance per hour cash ledger, 4,262.83. All right, so 
What we're going to do is we're going to reconcile the bank balance down to an adjusted balance, which we see here is 4,693 and 32 cents. We're also going to reconcile our cash ledger balance down to an adjusted balance. Do you see that when we are done with the reconciliation, that ending adjusted balance is the same on both sides? That's what these arrows are for here at number six. Everyone see that? So literally I can say this, when we start the process, the bank is wrong. Our cash ledger, when we start with, is wrong, but there is a third balance that's actually the correct balance. That is the adjusted cash balance. All right, so let's go back into the prior slide and what else is telling us here. Four outstanding checks totaled $717.75. Remember what is it? what an outstanding check is. It's a check that we wrote. It came out of our cash ledger, but the bank does not know about it yet. So this is going to be an adjustment on the bank side. The bank does, know, does not know about these $717.75 worth of checks. So I'm going to deduct them off of the, uh, the bank side of the ledger, of the reconciliation, excuse me. Next item that we have on our list, when we, rec when we look at the bank statement, I'm sorry, when we look at the, uh, the, the cash um, ledger, we see a deposit of $410.90. It was made after banking hours on the last day of the month, July 1. It doesn't appear anywhere on the bank statement. It, the bank actually gave us credit for this on the next day, August 1. This is called a deposit in transit. Once again, the bank doesn't know about it. And so what we're going to do is on the bank side of the reconciliation, we're going to add this deposit in transit, $410. So after we add the deposit in transit, subtract out the outstanding checks that the bank doesn't know about, we get our adjusted balance. Next, on July 30th, the bank returned JB Balls NSF check for $50.25, received as payment of an accounts receivable. This is a bad check. This is a bounced check. All right, some of you may have heard the slang term which is bounced check, and that's exactly what we have here. We thought we got paid, and we were excited. We, we recorded the cash with the debit, and we reduced the receivable with a credit. Now we're finding out, oh, no, our customer did not do good on his check. So on our records, balance per our ledger, that's what we started with, this $50.25 that we thought was good, it's bad, so it needs to be under the deduct section. You see that we have here an SF check, $50.25. Next, the bank statement showed $24.74 in interest. Let's go to that one. We're going to add that over here under the add, under the cash ledger, interest earned during July, $24.74. We didn't know about that, so we got our check. I mean our statement. What else does it say here? The bank also collected a non-interest bearing note for $500. So the bank collected $500 for us and for their service they also charged us a $5 collection fee. So let me come back here. We can see under the add section of the the reconciliation we're going to add the $500 that they collected on our behalf. And underneath the deduct section, you can see we see the collection fee here for $5. Next, check number 893 for telephone expenses cleared the bank for $85, but we made a mistake in our books and records. On our cash ledger, we accidentally, erroneously recorded in our books the expense for $58. You see what we did? It was supposed to be for 85, but we recorded it for 58. What did we do? We mixed up the 8 and the 5. This is called a transposition error where we transpose numbers. Accountants do this all the time. So what did we do? We recorded an expense for 58, but we should have recorded in an expense for 85. That difference we need to deduct out of our account. The error, 
It's a $27 error, the difference between the 85 and the 58, right? We didn't record enough expense. We didn't record enough deduction out of our cash account, so I'm going to reduce it. And last but not least, the bank charged a, a service charge of $12, and that's going to be on the deduct side. So after we reconcile our cash ledger down to our adjusted ledger balance, we can see that it's in agreement with the adjusted bank. We're done. Our bank statement is in, uh, is in agreement. Now, the last step is this. Now, remember, if we take a look at our cash ledger, it shows this number, 4,262. But we want it to show this number, 4,693. So all of the activity on the cash side, the cash ledger side of the bank reconciliation, all this activity here that I'm circling with my cursor, all that information needs to be recorded in journal entries. And here are the adjusting journal entries. You can see cash was increased by $524.74. Why? Two reasons. The bank collected a $500 note receivable for us, so we will reduce the note receivable with a credit, and they, and they gave us $24.74 in interest on our account balance. Um, and the cash ledger was decreased by this $94.25. Why? $17 in a bank service charge. This was 12 plus 5, if you recall. We broke it out, a $12 piece and a $5 piece. But there's your $17. $50.25. We thought we collected a receivable, but it was a bounced check, so we have to reinstate the receivable with a debit. And the telephone expense where we transposed the 5 and the 8, and the 8 and the 5, and we did not record $27 worth of expenses as we should have. After we recorded these adjusting journal entries as a result of the bank reconciliation, our bank, um, our bank ledger, I'm sorry, our cash ledger balance is going to equal what we want it to equal. And that would be the adjusted balance per the bank reconciliation, the 4,693 and 32 cents. Okay. So that part of the PowerPoint presentation deals with cash. We have cash over and short from counting the, the register. Um, we have internal controls to establish. And of course, we have reconciling the bank statement at the end of every month. Okay, the next part of the presentation deals with investments. This is when we have excess cash lying around and we want to invest. All right, and so let's go through an example. Foster Corporation purchases a short-term investment, 4,000 shares of the Coca-Cola company on December 1. Foster paid $48.98 per share, plus a brokerage commission of $80. Now, I want you to take a look at the orange box on the bottom of this slide. What happens is this orange box describes what is going on here. So the total cost is $48.98 times 4,000 shares plus an $80 commission fee. If you do the math, that works out to $196,000. So $196,000, how many shares are we buying? 4,000 shares. <clears throat> so our cost per share is $49 each. Keep this 49 in, my, in, in the back of your mind. We're going to need it in the very near future. But anyway, for purposes of this journal entry, we're going to increase this asset called marketable securities. That is an investment account. It is an asset. And we're writing a check. So we will reduce cash with a credit. That was on December 1st. Now, two weeks later, on December the 15th, Foster Corporation receives a $0.30 cent per share dividend on its 4,000 shares of Coca-Cola. 4,000 times $0.30 cents each, that works out to $1,200. We got a nice check in the mail. So we're going to increase cash with $1,200 with a debit, and we're going to record dividend revenue. We've earned it. Revenue, as you know, will get increased with a credit. All right, that was December 15th. Now, three days later, we go to sell. Uh, not all 4,000 shares 
but we decided to sell some of it. We sold 500 out of our 4,000 shares. We sold it and we sold it for $50.04 per share, but we also paid a brokerage commission of $20. So if you take a look at the orange box on the bottom of this slide, we can see what did we actually receive. We received $50.04 times 500 shares and subtract out a $20 commission, we actually received $25,000. So that is why in the journal entry, we're going to increase the cash account with a debit of $25,000. Now what we need to do, and this is something that's new to you at this point in the course, we need to reduce the marketable securities for the amount, the same amount that we actually increased it at. If you recall from the prior slide, do you remember our cost per share worked out to $49 per share? So we just sold 500 shares. So I'm going to reduce the marketable securities account by 500 shares times our cost basis, which is 49. That works out to 24,500. Because we received more cash than the original cost, $500 difference, that is a gain. A gain works like a revenue. Gain will be recorded on the income statement and it will increase net income. If we sold this at a loss, we would actually have a debit here for a loss on the sale of investment. Losses work like expenses. They reduce net income. So it's very important you understand how that works. And here's an example of that. A couple days later, December 27th, Foster Corporation sells an additional 2,500 shares of its Coca-Cola stock. So remember, we originally bought 4,000 shares, we sold 500 shares, and now we're selling an additional 2,500 shares. Selling price is $48.01, less a 25% brokerage free fee. If you take a look at the orangish box on the bottom of the slide, um, you can see our sales proceeds. $48.01 times the 2,500 shares minus the $25 brokerage fee. We are actually receiving $120,000 in cash. So I'm going to increase my cash account with a debit, $120,000. Now remember, our cost basis is $49. So $2,500 times $49, that means we're going to reduce the marketable securities account by this $122,500. We received less than what our original cost is. That is a loss. Losses are debits just like expenses. Gains, as we saw on the prior slide, are credits just like revenues. Losses work like expenses. They reduce net income. Gains work like revenues. They increase net income. Okay. Now at the end of the year, um, we only have 1,000 shares left because we originally bought 4,000 and we sold 3,000 shares. So at the end of the year, December 31, we're ready to prepare a financial statement. We have 1,000 shares, but the current market value is $47,000. Now remember, our cost basis is $49 a share, so 49 times 1,000. So our cost basis is 49,000, but it's got a current market value of 47,000. As we said earlier in this presentation, is marketable securities are reported on the balance sheet at market value. Now the original cost, like I said, was 49,000. The market value is 47,000. We have a $2,000 decrease in the marketable security. So at the end of the year, on December 31st, in the general journal, we're going to reduce our asset called the marketable securities. We would do so with a credit. And we're going to, instead of debiting a loss, we're going to debit, look at what this account says, an unrealized holding loss. We didn't lose the money yet because we didn't sell it but it's a paper loss. It's a loss at this moment in time. Now that could go away. It can turn into a gain in the very near future. But as of this moment in time, it's an unrealized loss. Now, how is that presented in the balance sheet? 
Well, take a look at it. Look at the red over here in the assets. We got marketable securities. And in brackets, we want to disclose the cost as well as the market value. And you can see in the actual balance sheet itself, we're showing the market value at this moment in time. It's 47000 And that unrealized loss, whether it's an unrealized gain or loss, that's going to be reported in the equity section. So unrealized holding losses, right? Obviously, it's, it's negative because... As you recall, equities have equity balances are credit, but this unrealized loss is a debit. That's why it's a reduction. Okay. If this was an unrealized holding gain, this number here would be positive. It would be a credit balance. All right. So hopefully you understand how that all works. All right. And now what we're going to do is we're going to account for accounts receivable, which is the third and final part of this presentation. Okay, receivables. This is when we make a credit sale, as you see on this slide here, and the account receivable um, is to be collected in the future. If the accounts receivable is impossible to collect, and we've come to the conclusion that the receivable is uncollectible, we need to record an expense. It is called an uncollectible accounts expense. Some companies call it a bad debt expense. You may have heard that term before. That simply means that the receivable cannot be collected. This is how it works. Here's the illustration. Assume that world famous toy company begins business on January 1, 2018, and it makes most of its sales on account. On January 31, accounts receivable amounted to 250,000. On this date, the credit manager reviewed the accounts receivable and estimated that approximately 10,000 out of the 250,000 will prove to be uncollectible. And the credit manager has his or her reasoning, and they're going to keep a file on all their customers. And for whatever reason, 10,000 out of the 250,000 is going to be difficult to collect. It's not impossible, but it's going to be difficult. So, what we're going to do is on January 31, the end of the month, we're going to record this uncollectible account expense or bad debt expense for 10000 Instead of crediting the accounts receivable directly, you're going to credit this contra receivable account. This contra receivable account is an allowance for doubtful accounts. And on the balance sheet, that accounts receivable, which has a debit balance, less its contra, the allowance for doubtful accounts, which as we saw a few seconds ago has a credit balance, we're going to show the net amount on the face of the balance sheet. As we stated earlier in this presentation, receivables are reported on the balance sheet at net realizable value. This is an excerpt of the world famous toy company. This is the partial the current assets section of their balance sheet. You can see we have cash of 75,000, marketable securities of 25,000, and our accounts receivable, the gross amount is 250, but is that is what is reported on the balance sheet? No. The net of 240. It's the it's the gross receivable of 250 lets its contra, the allowance for doubtful accounts. And of course we have our inventory. All right? Now Next step. Next step is when you've come to the conclusion that it's no longer improbable to collect, it's now become an impossibility. That is the next step. What we're going to do is you're going to write off the allowance for doubtful accounts. Let's read. To illustrate, assume that early in February, world famous toy company learns that discount stores, which is one of their customers that owes them money, it's gone out of business. And the $4,000 account receivable from this customer is now worthless. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that allowance for doubtful accounts that we established when we thought um, that the receivable was uncollectible. Now we've con come to the foregone conclusion. It is absolutely 100% uncollectible. And this is called the write-off journal entry. And as you can see, um, uh, this is a typo here. It should say February 5th. 
Um, but we're going to now get rid of the allowance. Remember, the allowance for doubtful accounts had a credit balance. So now we're going to get rid of it with a debit and look at the credit now, the receivable. The receivable is now fully gone. All right. Now, as you can see, what did we do? We reduced uh, re uh, the allowance with the debit and we reduced the receivable with a credit. That does nothing to the net realizable value. It just reduces the receivable from 250 down to 246 and it reduces the allowance from 10 down to 6. So the net realizable value doesn't change when we write off an allowance for doubtful accounts, but it certainly affects some of the detail that makes up the net realizable value. Okay, how do we estimate how much is uncollectible? There's really three approaches. Your textbook goes through two of them. Let me explain the best way, which the, the book is actually missing, your textbook. The best way is this. You hire a credit manager. You make sure that credit manager has a file on each and every one of your customers. That credit manager eats and sleep, eats, breathes and sleeps your customers. They know exactly what is going on with your customers. If there is any doubt about collectability, you record the possible uncollectible first in the allowance for doubtful accounts and record the uncollectible account expense. And then if it becomes an impossibility, you write it off. That is the best way. Hire a credit manager, go down account by account by account. Okay, now the two ways that your textbook goes through to estimate the amount of uncollectible receivables. There's a balance sheet approach. There's also an income statement approach. First, the balance sheet approach. What we do with the balance sheet approach is we prepare an aging schedule. Now, in this example, our total receivable is $100,000 at this date, December 31, 2018. When we look at the details of that $100,000 in receivables and we break it down by how old it is, 51,000 of it is not yet due. It's basically brand new. 29,000, as you see from this chart, is 1 to 30 days past due. 12,000 is 31 to 60 days past due. 3,000 is 61 to 90 days past due, and 5,000 is over 90 days past due. Now, hopefully you will all agree with me that as a receivable gets older, it becomes more difficult to collect. I would imagine most of you, if not all of you, I hope all of you, would agree with that statement. And so what the organization does is they put together, and the credit manager helps with this, the percentage, and they use past historical um, activity to help us with these percentages. So not yet due, 51,000. The vast majority of that is going to be collectible, but 1% of it is deemed uncollectible. So if you take the 51,000, multiply it by 1%, you get $510. One to 30 days past due, 29,000. It's getting a little older, 3% of it is uncollectible. The result is 870. 31 to 60 days past due, 12,000. Getting a little older, 10% of it is now deemed uncollectible. You come all the way down to your last aging category, over 90 days past due, $5,000. You got a 50-50 shot of collecting it at this point. 50% deemed uncollectible equals 2,500. If you add up everything in your calculation, this $5,680, you know what this represents? This $5,680 is what the balance should be in our contra receivable account, our allowance for doubtful accounts. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to compare that $5,680 to what is in already the allowance for doubtful account. Let me just paraphrase what this slide is saying. Right before this analysis, the allowance for doubtful accounts had a $4,000 balance. Well, it needs to have a $5,680 balance. How can we make that adjusted? Take a look at the journal entry on the bottom of your screen here. We are going to debit uncollectible accounts expense for the difference 
the $5,680, and we're going to increase the allowance for doubtful accounts by the $1,680. The next method is an income statement approach. You don't take the balance sheet receivable account, but you actually take your sales. And as an example, and you see this example here, a company's past experience says, well, whenever we make a sale on credit, about 2% of all of our credit sales will be deemed uncollectible. So if we made $150,000 credit sales in the month of September, 2% of that $150,000 or $3,000 is deemed ultimately uncollectible. Well, there's your journal entry. Debit your uncollectible accounts expense and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts. So we have a balance sheet approach. We have an income statement approach. We also have the approach I mentioned, which is hire a credit manager. Okay, now, sometimes a receivable that we write off actually miraculously gets collected. Is it rare? Yes, but it does happen from time to time. Okay, so let's assume a company wrote off a $500 account from this customer, Brad Wilson, the write-off, when we did it, and you see it here at the bottom of your slide, we debited the allowance for doubtful accounts and we credited the receivable, $500, it's gone. It's off our books. Now, miraculously, Brad pays. What we need to do, whenever we recover a receivable that has been previously written off, what we need to do is record two journal entries. First, we need to reinstate the receivable so you see this journal entry here on the top of your screen. We're basically undoing the write-off. You're putting the receivable back on the books with a debit, and you're putting the allowance for doubtful accounts back on the books with a credit. Okay? That's what we got to do. And we'll also record the, the, the cash. So we will debit the cash and credit the receivable for the 500. All right, so that's something that we would need to do. All right. Now, instead of using the allowance method, some smaller companies, they can take a shortcut and they can take those two journal entries, the journal entry for recording the allowance, the contra receivable, and the journal entry for the write-off, and they can combine those two journal entries and directly write it off. And so that's what is, that is what's done with smaller companies, where they simply say, okay, this $250 in this example, I know my customers better than they know themselves. You know the type I'm talking about, right? They know their customers so well. They know them inside and out. They say, okay, there's no way this customer is going to pay us. I'm writing it off for good. You just completely bypass the allowance for doubtful accounts. You go directly debit expense, credit receivable, wipe your hands clean, gone. That is the direct write-off method. Okay, um, credit, uh, let me see, note receivable. Okay, sometimes what we're going to do is we can convert our accounts receivable into a note receivable. This is when we are negotiating with one of our customers and they say, please give me a little bit more time. And in exchange for giving me more time to pay the receivable, I'll also pay you interest. So we can convert an account receivable into a note receivable. And if we do calculate interest, I just want to show you here, and we will study this, of course, in a future chapter as well. But there is a formula for interest, and that formula is as follows. Principal times rate times time. Principal times the interest rate for the year times the time. Here's an example. Interest rates are on, a, on an annual basis. So it is, as an example, <coughs> A $200,000 note receivable, um, it's a 6% note receivable, it's a computed as follows. So the principal is 200,000 times the interest rate, 6%, which is also the same as 0 0.06, times the time. The time is as a percentage of the year. So since it's for a full year, we'll say times one. So the interest for the year is 12,000. Now, let's say, look at the bottom, what if the note was not for a full year, but it was only for four months? Okay, so principal is 200,000 times the interest rate, 
Now the time is not times 1. Look at what it says. It says times 4 twelfths. <coughs> That's because the time period is only 4 months out of 12 for the year. So be very careful with, with that. And so if we convert an account receivable into a note receivable, you would record a journal entry as follows. Debit note receivable, credit accounts receivable. And we do that on December 1. We, we, we recorded and we made a three-month 6% note receivable. <coughs> and at the December 31st, one month um, into the year, and we're preparing financial statements, we have to accrue one month's worth of interest. And so here's your formula. 60,000 principal times 6% rate times the time 1 12th, one month, $300. Debit the interest receivable, credit the interest revenue, and we'll collect the interest receivable, hopefully like the, uh, the note receivable. All right, and um, three months later, we collect not only the $60,000 note receivable, we collect the $300 interest receivable um, for December, and we also collect the $600 interest revenue for January and February. And you can see the formula down here. 60,000 times 6% um, times 3 twelfths is $900 total interest, but $300 was revenue in the prior period. $600 is interest for January and February. So hopefully that all makes sense. And then the last slide I'm gonna talk about is the customer could default on the note. And then you gotta in turn take the note receivable and all of the interest earned on that note back into an account receivable and go back to square one and try to collect it. All right, so this is a great chapter. It went through uh, financial assets. We went through cash. We went through accounting for marketable securities as well as accounts receivable.